we will continue our discussion on the broad topic of you know how how to respond to wrongdoing to when people do wrong to wrongs actions towards us how do we respond to them so yesterday i talked about three main points first i talked about the concept how the same same event particular event can be placed in multiple causal frames that something can be attributed to some immediate cause some bigger cause some bigger causes like that then we talked about the context intelligence means to see place things in proper perspective now proper perspective means the perspective that enables us to practice dharma and then the contemplation that we do especially when we on the devotional path is that buddhi yoga we want not just intelligence but the intelligence to establish a connection with krishna so in particular situation how can i serve krishna so we are discussing this based on the rama and how lord ram treated kaike differently and ravan differently because the context was different with respect kaike he said that it's a past life it's destiny that she is acted like this with uh, with um, ravan considered ravan responsible and punished him for that so now let's move on today i talk about krishna consciousness so krishna conscious vision a krishna conscious vision of everything Mm-hmm. what does it mean to, to see a spiritual vision everywhere to that means see krishna as the cause of everything mm-hmm. or you can put it let's put it another way to make it symmetrical see everything as caused by krishna and the other means see everything as an opportunity to serve krishna to see everything as an opportunity to serve krishna so krishna consciousness does not necessarily mean this all the time but this definitely is true let me explain the examples like yesterday i had given an example when the rath ghat collapsed in london prabhupad said it is not due to poor engine it is not due to because your poor devotion it is due to poor engineering so it is not that krishna caused the earth to fall so what exactly is going on over here what are we trying to say and why does this matter mm-hmm. so see, when bad things happen when people hurt us mm-hmm. what does it mean mm-hmm. so if we consider sita was abducted mm-hmm. now we say not a blade of grass moves without the will of the lord that is true so if sita is abducted is that also the lord's will if it is the lord's will then why does the lord make so much endeavor to try to correct what has happened so here it's important to understand what does the word will mean the word will can have many meanings ranging from intention to permission upadrashta anumanta ch bharta bhokta maheshwar krishna in the 13th chapter of the bhagavad gita clearly mentions that he is the permitter anumantach he doesn't say that he is the cause of everything 
that now that it is sarva karana karanam we can say that krishna is the cause of all causes that is true sarva karana karanam but that does not mean he is the cause of all effects what is the meaning of this that see when sita is abducted ultimately everybody's every power comes from the lord as prahlad says to hiranyakashipu when hiranyakashipu asks what is the source of your power how dare you challenge me how dare you oppose me where are you getting this power from so at that time what does the lord uh, prahlad reply that vishnu is the source of the strength of everyone hmm? he is the source of the strength of of my strength of your strength even the sense of strength, strength of brahma who is the source of your strength so that means ravan his strength to abduct sita also comes ultimately from ram hmm? and in that sense if lord ram does not give him the power he cannot do anything mm -hmm. at the same time so so when we say will as permission if the lord does not allow something to happen it cannot happen so if lord ram had not wanted uh, had not allowed sita to be abducted he would not uh, she would not have been abducted so here hmm, there is the spiritual world there is the material world now in the spiritual world there is the lord say let's consider ram over here and then ram descends to this world as an avatar now the lord as ram is omnipotent now within leela he doesn't is not always exhibiting manifesting his omnipotence just like krishna in the damodar leela he manifests his omnipotence initially by not letting the rope tie him no matter how much ishoda might tie it tries it and then he lets himself be tied but then he can't untie the rope but then so when he's not letting the rope uh, tie him he's showing his omnipotence omnipotence means the capacity to do anything potency is power omni is all all power means the capacity to do anything so he's showing his omnipotence there when suddenly he stops showing his omnipotence and then again he starts uh, showing his omnipotence when he It's a small child, but it drags a mortar, which is itself quite heavy, and it drags the mortar so forcefully that a giant tree comes down. So basically, what we are talking about here is that when the Lord may choose sometimes to manifest His omnipotence and sometimes not manifest, but when we are talking about things happening in our lives. so the lord may not always manifest his omnipotence in fact most of the times in the material world the lord does not manifest his omnipotence sometimes he does so from the perspective of not leela but tatva the tatva and leela now tatva is the philosophical truth the leela is the past time leela omnipotence is sometimes manifested omnipotence always possessed by the lord 
it is not that the Lord is ever non-omnipotent. He is always omnipotent. He always has all power. Okay. So, he always has all power, but he sometimes manifests, sometimes doesn't manifest. Now, this may seem a little confusing, but I'll try to make it simple soon. Mm -hmm. The point is that when the, when the Lord and Krishna or Ram, whoever want to say that, Krishna, when something happens in this world, it is not that he is causing it all the time. So, say here is little Prahla. And here is the monster Hiranyakashipu. Hmm? Now, at one level, we could say uh, the Lord Vishnu exists above everyone in the spiritual domain. But on another level, we can also say that Vishnu is the source of the power of everyone. So Hiranyakashipu's power comes from Prahala, from Vishnu. Now, when Hiranyakashipu decides to attack Prahalad. So, at that time, Hiranyakashipu cannot attack Prahalad if he does not have power. If Lord Vishnu wants, he can take away all his power immediately. But when Hiranyakashipu is attacking, it is not that Vishnu is attacking Prahalad to Hiranyakashipu, through Hiranyakashipu. No, rather, Vishnu appears there as Narasimha in a far bigger form and he attacks Hiranyakashipu and he punishes him. So the point I'm making here is that the Lord is the ultimate cause of all causes. If you go back over here, cause of all causes not the cause of all effects. So here, what do I mean by this? The cause is Hiranyakashipu's strength by which he's attacking him. So Hiranyakashipu's strength, it comes from Krishna. Mm -hmm. But the effect is Hiranyakashipu's attack on attack on Prahalad. This is not coming from Krishna. This, it comes from Hiranyakashipu himself. It is his free will. It depends on him how he uses his free will. So, it is not that Krish Vishnu or Krishna or Narasimhadev is attacking Hiranyaka Prahalad through Hiranyakashipu and then he is protecting him. When Draupadi is being disrobed, it is not that Krishna is entering into Dushasan and is, is attacking Draupadi. Absolutely not. It is Dushasan who is misusing his free will. And now Dushasan cannot misuse his free will if Krishna does not give him strength. So in that sense, if we use the word cause as the capacity to do something, cause as Capacity to act and affection as the action, its effect, effect as the action itself. Then the capacity to act always comes from Krishna. But the action itself may not come from Krishna. The standard example that is given in the Vedan Sutra and other places is that if we consider the rain and vegetation. So... The rain is the cause of all causes in the sense that without rain, there is no vegetation. But the specific seeds that are there in the ground, that will be the cause of all effects. That means what vegetation grows where. So, Krishna's will is like the rain. 
Krishna's will is like the rain and our free will is like the seeds. So why is all this important? That when bad things happen to us, when Sita is abducted, Sita does not think, oh, you know, I, I am the consort of Ram. How did Ram let me be abducted like this? She does not blame Ram. When bad things happen to us, it's so easy for us to blame God. Why did God not protect me? Why did God not stop this? But Sita does not do that. She maintains her faith in Ram. And she sees that Ram will come and protect me. Ram will come and rescue me. Ram will come and his love for me will become manifest for me. Even if right now I cannot perceive his presence and his love directly. So, if we are to maintain our faith, we don't see Krishna as the cause of everything all the time. We see Krishna as everything is an opportunity for service. And that is ultimately arranged by Krishna. And ultimately arranged by Krishna. So, that means that sometimes some bad people may do some bad things, like Dushyasana did something terrible, but that was an opportunity for Draupadi to surrender to Krishna, surrender to uh, surrender and take shelter and thereby um, demonstrate to the world the glory of her devotion. Well, that is true. That does not mean that Draupadi or what she is doing is in any way or uh, what was done to her was Krishna, was willed, was desired, was intended by Krishna. Let me give two examples of oh, from our practical life now why this could be a problem. So, why what could be a problem? To see Krishna as the cause of everything. This can actually hmm, affect our Krishna consciousness negatively. Because that is not always true also. So, for example, I was in Europe and one European couple came to meet me. And... The Mataji looked very, very sad. And then they told that you know, they had had four miscarriages. So it's terribly distressing to hear that. And then she said that, she was a Western Mataji, she said that before she had been introduced to Bhakti, um, she had had an abortion. That's not uncommon in the Western world. Even in India, it's not uncommon nowadays. And she said she heard in some class by some devotee that, you know, if you kill a baby that Krishna has sent you through abortion, Krishna will never let you have any babies. So she was saying, you know, how long will I keep having miscarriages like this? When will Krishna end this punishment? Will he never end? So I told her, first of all, no, Krishna is not a person who ex extracts punishments like that. Whoever said this, I haven't seen any Shastric, shastric Praman like that. That if you come into the abortion, you will not have a child. There are so many thousands and thousands of people who have done that, unfortunately, tragically. But, and they do have children. So these kind of categorical statements are themselves highly questionable. But more importantly, whenever something is happening like this, we have to look at the immediate cause, not the ultimate cause immediately. Like I said, look for the drushta explanation before the adrushta explanation. So when there is a miscarriage, the adrushta, the adrushta means the non-visible explanation is it is a reaction to abortion. 
Is that possible? Maybe, but that is the Drishta explanation is, is there any biological cause? Is there any biological factor at all? So I asked her husband, and he said, yes, there are some issues and we are trying to get some treatment for it. So I said that, that don't see Krishna as the cause of this. Now we say, isn't Krishna ultimately controlling biology also? Maya Dekshina Prakriti. Yes, of course, that is true. But it is not that Krishna is personally or intentionally orchestrating everything that is happening at the material level with a particular, uh, everything as a particular reaction to a particular action. The principle of karma and karma is a principle of, it works at a material level. And the judge decides that some action should have some reaction. That is not that the judge has a personal agenda against a particular criminal. No. So the point is, the we need to look at the biological factor. So if I am giving a class and say, right now the Zoom connection goes off, should I start thinking, oh, you know, maybe Krishna doesn't want me to give a class because Krishna thinks I'm not qualified. Like say, I couldn't come to Calgary. Now, should I think that, oh, because I am so sinful, so I got a reaction. The reaction was that I, I my leg got injured. And if I am so sinful, then that means I am not qualified to speak about Krishna. So let me not speak about Krishna. So it's Krishna saying, first of all, when that particular thing happened, is it that Krishna is sending, first of all, if I slipped and fell, so this common sense explanation, we would look at, was there some water? Was I inattentive? Did I not notice the water? How did I slip and fall? There is no need to raise everything to the level of Krishna and then bring Krishna into everything. We say, but isn't that Krishna consciousness? No, I'll talk about what Krishna consciousness is later. That, say, one devotee was telling me, today I have learned that I should chant attentively. Okay, how do you learn that lesson? Say, I did not chant attentively in the morning today. And when I was going for office, my car broke down. So I was worried about my work in the chanting time, so I couldn't chant. And I reached also late, so my work became even problem or problematic. So Krishna punished me by making my car break down. Really? Then I asked him, that, did your car have any problems? He said, yeah, actually, I've not see, taken it to a mechanic for a long time. I was so busy. Okay, so there is the cause. So is Krishna a vengeful God waiting to catch it? Hey, you did that wrong. I'm going to punish you now. See, Krishna is a... Krishna is actually a loving God, not a punishing God. Mm -hmm. Krishna is always watching. But he's watching... Not to catch us whenever we go wrong. Whenever we do wrong. Hey, you did this wrong. Now I'm going to punish you. That is not the mood of Krishna. Krishna's mood is to catch us whenever we fall. This is like a mother and a small child. If the child is learning to walk, the mother is very carefully watching how my child is taking some steps. And the child slips and falls, the mother will run forward and catch. So the mother is watching the child, but the mother doesn't get a joy. Hey, you did that wrong. Now I'm going to punish you for this. That's not the mood of Krishna. It's a horrendous misconception of who Krishna is. So to the extent we keep this in mind, that Krishna is a loving God. And we, whenever something is going wrong, yes, there is. What can I learn? So what can I learn? Okay, that rather than, can I learn that I should chant well? Okay, that's a good lesson to learn. But also a lesson to learn is that if my car requires servicing, I cannot neglect the servicing. I have to do the servicing. So if I slip and fall, and that's because I have some water I didn't notice. And I, if I'm walking, I should notice where there's water. I should. So the point is that 
we cannot uh, bring Krishna and hold Krishna responsible for the things that happen because of some intermediate causal factors that can make people very averse to Krishna at times. So other example, these are I mean, multiple examples just to illustrate the same point. There is one devotee. So, so how is all this related to the Ramayana? In the Ramayana, although Sita was with Ra, and somebody will say that God is supposed to protect everyone, God could not protect his own wife. So why should I even worship such a God? Did Sita think like that? Why did she not think like that? Because she understood that in the material world, things happen in particular ways. And the Lord did come and rescue her eventually. So, bad things happen to everyone. And the relationship between the bad thing that happens to us and God's supreme controllership, it's a mysterious relationship. It's not a very straightforward relationship. And that's why we can't arrive at simplistic conclusions. So, another example to illustrate this point that. Okay, let's take a example of uh, how um, a wrong lesson could also be drawn from scripture. So within scripture itself, so Duryodhan in the Mahabharata. Even Ravan himself thought like this. When Ravan was told that Ram is actually Vishnu, don't mess with him. Now, Ravan's reasoning was, if he's Vishnu, how could I have abducted his wife? The fact that I succeeded in abducting his wife means that he cannot be Vishnu. Well, that is wrong reasoning. That is, okay, Vishnu may give you some power for some time to do some things. But Vishnu also gives us the intelligence to evaluate whether what we are doing is right or wrong. So just because some result works out right in the short run does not mean that God wanted us to do that thing. Mm -hmm. That or other God, uh, God is not involved and God is supporting us, something like that. That's the wrong conclusion to arrive at. So I was in... Uh, I was in Alachua. Alachua is a place in America where a lot of senior Prabhupada disciples are living. So I met one devotee over there. He said, I took a break from Bhakti for almost 25 years. And then, of course, the last 15 years he had been practicing. Before that, for 15 years he had been practicing. Mm -hmm. So, I asked him what happened. So, he said that when he was there in the temple, um, he was living full time. Then, after Prabhupada departed, he decided to move out of the temple. Then, he got married. And he got married to a woman who was not a devotee. And she was sometimes interested in bhakti, sometimes not interested in bhakti. And she was a little emotionally disturbed. And then, one day he came back home and to his horror, he found that his wife had taken her life. It was completely shattered. Immediately called 911 and everything, but it was too late. And then he called the devotee in the temple where he had been regularly connected. He said, this has happened. Now, that particular temple leader, he had been in touch with him. And that temple leader told him that, no, she was just a distraction in your bhakti. And Krishna has removed that distraction. Now. See this as Krishna removing the distraction so that focus, you can focus on your bhakti. And that devotee even said that when Narad Muni, Narad Muni was a small boy, at that time, his mother was very attached to him. And so, when and so Narbuni was able, able to pursue spiritual growth. But when a snake bit her and she passed away, at that time, 
Nargoni started focusing on spiritual growth. And he left his home. So see it like that. Now, he told me that he said he became so disgusted. He was already distressed. He became disgusted. He says, don't you people have any humanity? I don't want to have anything with a group like you. So the devotee who told him might have been well-intentioned. But there's a serious problem, many problems, first of all. First is that there is a big difference between an accident where somebody dies because of something like a snake bite and somebody taking their own lives. Now, when somebody commits suicide, there's always the survivor's guilt. And, you know, did I, could I have done anything to stop this person from taking this extreme step? And especially, if one is a life partner and that relationship is often emotionally charged relationship or worse still the survivors guilted, did I do anything that pushed this person over the edge? So to equate a death by accident with a death by suicide and then to try to extract, oh, you know, the Krishna has made this arrangement. This is a horrifying misapplication of Krishna conscious philosophy. It is at that particular time the soul has departed from the world. Now, how can that soul, whatever be the circumstances, the soul has departed? How can that soul's journey be facilitated? You know, how can the person who is traumatized by that, how can that person be supported? That is what should be important. So we don't see now. Did Krishna cause that person to commit suicide? Obviously not. Krishna never tells anyone to commit suicide. If a person decides to end their life, it is that person who is doing it. And rather than uh, seeing that person either as a victim or a wrongdoer, we need to just see now this, ter this terrible action has happened. Well, how can we make the, what can we do about it now? So sometimes if we bring Krishna as the cause of every situation, that can be a big problem because we don't really know. A person has committed suicide, has Krishna caused that? Well, we can say Krishna didn't cause it, Krishna allowed it. Okay, Krishna allowed it. That is true. But if that person did that decision, what was the cause of that decision? Isn't that also a relevant factor to be considered at a particular time? So the reason I'm making is that every situation to be Krishna conscious in all situations means that I'm going back to the first part that I made that See Krishna as the cause, everything as caused by Krishna. That is a questionable assumption, questionable inference. It is everything as an opportunity to serve Krishna. That is true. But how exactly to serve Krishna? In that, a person has to use their intelligence. A person has to understand what am I to do right now? What exactly is the situation? What exactly is the problem? And what can I do to solve the problem at this particular point? So if we start seeing everything as caused by Krishna, then either our own heart will go against Krishna or people's hearts will start going against Krishna. And we may well be philosophically also quite seriously wrong. But to conclude this point, when there is distress in this world, this is the last point I'll make and then we have questions. So distress and Krishna, distress or you can say adversity and Krishna, what is the relationship between these two? So there are three ways this kind of relationship can be there. One is Krishna is the cause. The other is Krishna is the cure. And a third is Krishna is the Comfort. So Krishna as the cause is questionable. Krishna may or may not be the cause. Sometimes our own mistake may be the cause. Sometimes when devotees were driving very fast and they maybe and they meet with an accident. Does Krishna cause that accident? No. That devotee caused that accident. So once one devotee was driving me and he said, he's going to drive way, way too fast. Because we were late for a problem. He said, Prabhu, please drive carefully. He said, no, Prabhu, we are driving for, uh, for Krishna's service. Krishna will protect us. I said, yes, Krishna will protect us. 
you know, by giving us the intelligence to drive safely. If we drive above the speed limit, one of my friends says that when you drive above the speed limit, Krishna leaves the car. <laughs> you know, that we can't say Krishna is the cause when something else gradual could be the cause. So is Krishna the cure? Certainly. Krishna is the ultimate cure. Atantika Dukha Nirvan. Whatever be the special reason why we're in trouble, the more we go closer to Krishna, the ultimately we'll be freed from distress. When we are at Krishna, at Krishna in the spiritual world, there will never be any distress. Is Krishna the comfort? Yes, he is the comfort also. Now, so when we are in trouble, we can remember Krishna, we can chant Krishna's names, we'll get some comfort, we can hear some bhajans, kirtans, we'll get some comfort. We'll get that comfort always? Maybe, maybe not. It may not be always, but it will be there. So the point is that uh, we need to see Krishna consciousness means ultimately Krishna is the cure, but Krishna may not always be the cause. And is Krishna the comfort? Well, sometimes, yes, Krishna is the comfort. Sometimes we may offer the uh, practical things also. When somebody is in distress, somebody lost a loud one, you go and chant Hare Krishna, you'll feel better. Okay, that may be true. But if they need some help, Okay, we have to perform the last rites, we have to do this, we have to do that. At that time, we can offer service to them and our service will be the way we connect with them with Krishna. So, we see that's why the focus is on see everything as an opportunity to serve Krishna. Not necessarily that everything is caused by Krishna. So, why a particular thing happens may be very difficult to know. But, that in every situation we can serve Krishna, that is an eternal truth. And we focus on that truth and thereby we grow in our lives. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. I discussed three main points. The key point was relationship between Krishna and distress in the world. So the first point I discussed is that Krishna is the cause of all causes, not the cause of all effects. This is the cloud is the cause of all vegetation, but the cloud is not the cause of the specific vegetation, the rains, not the cloud, the rains, you can say, the cause of all vegetation, but not the specific vegetation that grows at a particular place. So when we say nothing happens without Krishna's will, so Krishna's will, that word can range from intention, that Krishna wanted any something to happen, it could also mean Krishna's permission. That Krishna let something happen, even if he didn't want it to happen. Hmm? And then the second point is that whenever we are looking for cause, cause of something, that um, we look for immediate causes, not necessarily the ultimate cause immediately. Mm -hmm. And now don't ascribe everything to the ultimate cause. The focus is ultimately nothing would happen without Krishna. We focus on how I can serve Krishna in this situation. That is what should be our focus. And that's where everything is an opportunity to serve Krishna. Now, is that opportunity personally directly arranged by Krishna? Or is Krishna expert enough to use somebody's misuse of free will to create that opportunity? That depends. I think it's an opportunity to serve Krishna. So now, how exactly we see serve Krishna? That's up to, we have to use our intelligence, Buddhi Yoga. So Krishna and distress when you're talking about this, we don't necessarily assume that Krishna is the cause of the distress. We understand that Krishna is ultimately the cure for all distress. And that's why we take shelter of Krishna. And immediately amid distress, can Krishna be a comfort? Yes, he can be. But that can be done by giving the holy name, by giving some practical service, by just being there to offer emotional support. There are many ways. So if our focus is on serving, 
then we will be able to best understand how to function in particular situations. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Uh, there is a question from a devotee. Uh, thank you, Prabhuji, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, as practicing devotees, we obviously do not want to hold on to hurtful things or bad things that have happened to us. But if there is no apology, no accountability or no responsibility that come from the individual that hurt us, then how do we practice detachment and let it go? How do we find solace and understanding that Krishna is watching and surrender unto him that justice will be given? Is it not that Krishna has played out certain situations for that person to act out in such a way so we can learn something? Thank you. See, the important principle over here is, let me see, I think that this connection has gone off over here. So, if we are focusing on, if that person, so like say, I am here, this person is here, Krishna is above us all. So now if this person has hurt us, hmm, now what do we do? Now that depends on how best we can see Krishna. Hmm. So if that person is not ready to take responsibility or change, then we have to decide. How do I move forward? Basically for us, We first appreciate that every situation is um, an opportunity for us. We appreciate that every situation is an opportunity where we can, we can have an opportunity to say that I met Krishna in this situation. M-E-T. M means mitigate. E is emigrate and T is tolerate. So all three options are there, but they are within the purview of service to Krishna. So when hmm, when uh, Abhibhishan was living in Lanka, he knew about Ravan's sinful activities, but he continued staying there and he tolerated that because he was doing his own dharmic activities over there. He was practicing bhakti. But at a particular time, uh, when Ravan's actions went to such an extent where he had abducted Sita and the whole kingdom of Lanka was threatened because of that abduction, then we should try to mitigate. When mitigation didn't work, then Vibhishan emigrated. Emigrated. He went to Lord Ram's side. So Vibhishan did all these three things in relationship with Ravan. So initially he was, then just before the war, he tried to mitigate. And then finally, he emigrated. So the idea is that there are different ways in which we can serve Krishna. And each one of us has to find out which is the best way we can serve Krishna. Srila Prabhupada at different times did different things. When he had a temple in the League of Devotees in America, in, in Jasi, and uh, some of the people who were supporting him went against him. And what did he do? He just walked away from the temple. He said, enough is enough, I don't want to spend my time fighting this war. Hmm. But then, was that all that he did when he was staying in the staying in the uh, house of say Sumati or uh, no of the house of Gopal Agarwal and Sally Agarwal in Butler, Pennsylvania? He couldn't. Uh, he the, in the same fridge in which he was there, he, he was keeping his boga. There he had meat. 
He told it and she apologized to Samji, we have only one fridge, we can't do much. But I didn't think nothing about it. Tolerated it. And then, but when the Jal, Juhu temple was to be built, at that time, we consider when the person tried to take the money and steal the land, Prabhupada said that he will have to, that Mr. N, Mr. Nair, he said he will have to go over my dead body before he can steal Krishna's money. So Prabhupada migrated, immigrated from Jhansi. He walked away from there. He tolerated in Butler, Pennsylvania. And he mitigated in Juhu, Mumbai. So a devotee's mood is every situation we see as an opportunity to serve Krishna. And then we decide how best we can serve Krishna in that particular situation. So we don't see Prabhupada thinking too much in his life that, oh, this must be my past karma, this must be my past karma. Prabhupada focusing on how can I serve Krishna in this situation. So when his, uh, if you can look at it in Prabhupada's dealings with his family also, if you want to see for that matter. Oh, Prabhupada, with, if you consider, Hila Prabhupada with his family. So initially, they were not supportive of his bhakti, but Prabhupada in his grihastha life, you know, he worked very hard, grihastha phase, he worked very hard, they were not interested in, they were pious people, his wife was pious, but they were not really interested in the missionary kind of preaching bhakti that he wanted to do. Prabhupada said, okay. Prabhupada tolerated it and continued his own preaching. But then, when he found that uh, eventually they were not at all interested in bhakti as he was getting, he was, he was beyond 50, he felt that he had done his immigration, then he took sannyas. Mm -hmm. He just decided that enough is enough. He, emig he emigrated from there. But then later on, when his con had been well established, mm, and his son came to meet him, and he said, we are in big financial trouble. You now, Prabhupada offered some support. Mm, as an Acharya, he made some will, he made some arrangements so that his family could be supported. But then unfortunately, what happened was his family, after Prabhupada departed, they did a court case against his con. They're saying that everything that belonged to Prabhupada was, uh, was actually their property because Prabhupada, it was owned by Prabhupada. And they tried to claim everything for Prabhu. For, but then the devotees had to fight a case against them. So, so basically we have to use our intelligence to see how best we can serve Krishna and not get too caught in the specific cause of something. Is it by caste karma? Is it because of Krishna? Okay, however this has happened, the cause is not as important as, okay, what can I do right now? How can I move ahead? Just like sometimes, when it is when people, when in medical field, people use a particular, uh, say that this is a particular disease. Now, they may not know a particular, when you say flu, it can have many different causes or even a set of symptoms are caused a, part, called a particular disease. Now, is it caused by this particular thing, that particular thing? They focus on the cure. To whatever extent we understand the cause, we understand the cause. But we focus on the cure. Like cancer, there are there's a whole genre of diseases where we don't know the cause, but to whatever extent we know the cure, we work on the cure. The same way, don't fixate too much on the cause. Yeah, so another question over there. Mm, cause. Learn if possible. But the cure is the primary focus. So that's the point over here. Now there's a question is, how does kar karma work if Krishna is the cause of all causes? Well, karma is a principle governing the world like gravity. So if I take this pen and I drop the pen, the pen is going to fall. Is this pen falling because of Krishna or is it falling because of gravity? Well, both. Gravity wouldn't exist exist because in spite of Krishna. Gravity wouldn't exist independent of Krishna. And just because I am a devotee of Krishna doesn't mean I can say that gravity should not act on me. 
me. No, gravity will still act. So a devotee does not deliberately defy karma, thinking that because now I'm a devotee, I shouldn't care for karma. Karma is a material principle governing the world. And that material principle is under Krishna's jurisdiction. So when it says that bhakti frees us from karma, that means a devotee is no longer within the material jurisdiction primarily. But that does not mean material factors don't affect a devotee. That just means that a devotee's consciousness is also fixed on Krishna, that a devotee's conscious consciousness won't be swerved by those material factors. It's like, uh, we can't be naive and simplistic if a devotee jumps off a 50-story building. Can the devotee say, oh, you know, gravity should not act on me because I'm devoted to Krishna, because I'm chanting Hare Krishna. Well, if you're really intelligent enough to chant Hare Krishna, then be intelligent enough to not step off that building also. Isn't it? So like that, if we are really intelligent, we'll be intelligent enough to practice bhakti and we'll be intelligent enough to avoid bad karma also. And if we can find out some immediate cause for a problem, we fix that problem. We don't artificially think that Krishna is bhakti or Krishna and karma. How do they work? If I am here, say, what is the relationship between the two of them? The relationship is if I am here, I am in the material world where it is the domain of karma. But Krishna is the meta circle that contains all the circles. So Krishna can intervene when he wants to. It's like say if you are working in a company. Person is in a team in a company. But that person is also the son of the owner of the company. Uh, so now, then can the owner of the company intervene if that person gets into trouble with the, with the team lead? It's possible. But the, if the person is responsible, that person will actually function within the team. Okay, this is a team lead. This is what I'm expected to do. I'll do it. So like that, a devotee functions harmoniously wherever the devotee is. A devotee doesn't demand that Krishna artificially intervene and protect us. Okay. Any other questions? There is a question from a devotee. Uh, Lord Rama wanted to keep small things small and for family harmony left for one was. Arjuna also wanted to keep it small and for family harmony was not willing to fight. But Krishna suggested otherwise. So how to understand these two situations differently? The situations are different because the, the offender was one time, Kaikai did a one-time offense and she regretted and repented and reformed. Mm. Duryodhan was not a person who had in any way repented or reformed. Duryodhan's wrongdoings were only increasing more and more and more. And if Arjuna had not fought against Duryodhan, all that Duryodhan would have done is, he would not have let the Pandavas live in peace. He would have attacked everyone who has supported the Pandavas. Arjuna's not fighting would not have prevented the war. Uh, so even if he had called off the war, even if say he could have got Bhima to stop fighting the war, to stop fighting, which is very unlikely. But even if he had supposed God Bhima to stop fighting, would Arjuna have forgotten, or would Duryodhana have forgotten all the people who had allied with the Pandavas? Hmm word, like now there's a war going on between America and America and Russia. Let's say it's Ukraine and Russia, but it's all Ukraine won't be able to fight unless America is supporting it. To say, tomorrow there is a peace. So if one side just unilaterally decides to stop the war, is it that the other side is going to forget who all supported them? And if that one side is like Duryodhan, Duryodhan will remember and torment and destroy everyone who supported his opposites. And eventually Arjuna will regret. 
that oh because i didn't fight all those who supported me had to suffer so basically when somebody is a repeat wrong doer then that person has to strong action has to be taken against them okay any other questions the bro there are couple of questions in the chat which you can can i read out yeah please yeah uh when one faces rejection either in career or from loved ones they try to reason out friends family try to look for reasons but in this process a self doubt is implanted in that person's mind thinking it is because of me it happened to me my question is how do we know that what one has done to you is what we deserve i don't think we need to get into this whole zone of what we deserve the fact is that in life bad things happen to everyone for some people more bad things happen some people maybe less bad things happen then we can say that for all of us here we are in america or canada you know it's for the bad things that are happening that are not as bad as say what is happening to somebody in israel or in gaza or in ukraine or maybe the war zones but that does not mean that whatever is happening bad there's no bad thing happening in russia america or you canada or wherever else the fact is that bad things happen to everyone and rather than thinking that i am getting only what i deserve when we don't want to be karma conscious we want to be krishna conscious and maybe karma consciousness is a part of krishna consciousness but it's only a part it's not the whole thing so this is krishna consciousness within that we can be karma conscious that's one factor to consider but the most important thing is to actually be krishna conscious that means okay whatever has happened okay maybe i maybe somebody betrayed me maybe i made a mess of things whatever has happened still krishna is in charge krishna will guide me let me focus on serving krishna and if i focus on that things will work out in due course but that should be our primary focus that let me try to serve krishna let me focus on the service of krishna so we need to know that krishna never abandons us no krishna if krishna had wanted to abandon us why would krishna get us this far you know we all have achieved certain some things in our life whatever it is even actually the world is such a dangerous place even survival itself is an achievement whatever be the age of each one of us there are so many people who die before they get to our age also so even survival is an achievement at one level so if we have achieved some things that means that uh, we have survived we have achieved something that means that there is we have worked we have done some work we have done some things right and god has also worked for us so god has not brought us this far to abandon us now so we focus more on okay what is the door that krishna is opening for me how can i serve krishna in this situation you now what resources do i have and from there we move forward we need this buddhi yoga i talked about now at one level it gives us some air to breathe sometimes we feel so suffocated and crushed by life that we just feel i can't i can't even survive so air is we look at what abilities we have we look at what interests we have we look at what resources we have and based on that we find some door that is open and we move forward from there okay so krishna is given us krishna will never abandon us he will give us some ability some interest some resource with which we can can move forward okay 
Any other questions? Uh, Roji, on, on the on karma, there's a follow-up question. If someone karma is so bad that he cannot have connections to Krishna to be good. Well, yeah, I saw that question. Well, somebody may not be able to connect with Krishna in particular ways, but that doesn't mean they can't connect with Krishna. Somebody may be maybe circumstantially say have a job where there's no temple available, no devotees available. But they can always connect digitally. They cannot go physically to a temple. They can attend classes online. They can connect with people through virtual means. Somebody may have to have a uh, may have a family situation where they may have they may be financially very challenged position. Or somebody may be so sick. So every situation can create certain limitation, but the limitation will be to for particular forms of bhakti. The limitation is not to bhakti itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. One last question. Uh, Rama is worshipped for killing Ravan for the abduction of Sita, but a man will be jailed for doing the same. The question is not clear. What does it mean? Uh, like a, I think they are basically saying that it is a crime to kill someone. Like because right right now, if someone okay, kills, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. So Ram is the martial guardian of society. Ram is like the king. Just like when the police shoot a criminal, when the army uh, kills an aggressor, that's not considered a crime. That's considered glorious. So we should not take the law in our own hands if we are ordinary citizens. So that we cannot replicate the exact thing that the law did. The principles we learn in the Bhagavad Gita tells Arjuna to fight. Uh, now, does that mean that every one of us have to fight today to follow the Bhagavad Gita? No. We don't, at least we don't have to fight a physical war. We have to fight an inner war against Anartha. That's fair enough. But the principle is that the specifics don't apply necessarily. But the principle applies. The principle is that we do our, we do our duty. We do our dharma. We do our dharma in a mood of service to the Lord. So the application will vary according to time, place, circumstance. The scriptures, they have, you know, what we can call as a, to study the scripture, there is something called a ladder of abstraction. That means there are specifics given in scripture and there are universals. And so, and then there are specifics that apply today. So this is like a ladder. So we go up this ladder, we understand the universal principle, and then we come down the ladder and we look at how that principle applies today. So, for example, Prabhupada does this when in the, in the scriptures, there's a description of yajna being performed. So Prabhupada says yajna is like tax in today's world. So the idea of tax is different, yajna is different. But it's a correlation. So Prabhupada takes a principle that we belong to a larger whole and we have to contribute to the larger whole because we're taking certain things from that whole. So we have to uh, look at the specific principles. Prabhupada, for example, in the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that Natat Bhasete Surya na Shashanko na Pavaka. So there the list that is given, the spiritual world is not illuminated by sun moon or fire. Now Prabhupada used those three and he also adds electricity over it. Now somebody may say electricity is not mentioned over there. So why is Prabhupada adding electricity? See Prabhupada is going from the specific to the universal. Universal is that the spiritual world is self-luminous. It is not dependent on any external source for light. So now in today's world, um, what are the external sources of light that people are familiar with? So one of them is electricity. So Prabhupada is translating the specifics from that level to the specifics at our level. So the specifics are not to be replicated. But the universal principles are to be understood and then we apply the specifics in our life. Okay. So thank you very much. Sri Ramachandra Bhagwan Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.
गौर भक्त वृंद की जाए गौर प्रेमानंदी 